So good afternoon everyone, it's Tracy Jarvis, I'm the director of PESI UK and we've got a very special guest today, we've got Pat Ogden, trauma expert and founder of Sensory Motor Psychotherapy joining us all the way from Boulder, Colorado and we're going to be talking the essentials of trauma treatment, looking at defense responses as well as orienting responses. So welcome everybody and welcome Pat. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So, Pat, let's start off. Uh, we've got many clinicians joining us today, um, counselors, psychotherapists, psychologists. Let's go back to basics. We're going to be looking at the psychology of action. Um, and can you say a little bit about what that is, why it's important in trauma treatment? Sure, that's a good place to start. Well, trauma of any kind, uh, first and foremost, affects the body, uh, doesn't affect our thoughts. Uh, I always think of, like, if you're falling down the stairs, your body will respond before you have a chance to think about it. You'll grab for the rail, you'll try to you know, break your fall. So when, when we're threatened, which is trauma, when we feel threatened, which is an interesting point because I think of trauma more about our experience of whatever happens rather than the actual event itself. But, so when we feel threatened, uh, it stimulates our autonomic arousal. Uh, our arousal shoots up to mobilize action and the action has its root in the instinctive brain. Uh, the action of cry for help or separation cry, to scream, to, uh, uh, you know, we're very familiar with this with infants. They scream for their caregiver when they're scared. Somebody bigger, wiser to come and, and rescue and take care of them. So there's the cry for help and there's, there's the fight or flight responses. Um, and those are all mitigated by very high sympathetic arousal. Uh, um, and when those fail, we automatically go to immobilizing action, which truncates any kind of movement. And one is also mitigated by the sympathetic nervous system called freeze, where we're like frozen, but immobile, but all our senses are alert, but we feel paralyzed, you know? And then the last resort is for arousal to plummet down to hypo arouse and arousal we just our muscles go flaccid and it's called you know to feign death in the animal kingdom we're familiar with that with possums who favor that particular uh, immobilizing defense and this was for me i i really had to learn about this from my clients because working emotionally and working cognitively didn't seem to really help my traumatized clients back in the 70s and, and early 80s. Um, and, and, and then you know, it, that's because trauma lives in the body. The body keeps the score, as Bessel famously now says. So how did you discover some of Piagenet's work around the psychology of action and kind of working with your clients when sort of cognitive and emotional sort of tools and ways weren't really helping? Like, how did you then get into discovering these incredible truncated responses as such? Well, I, I actually discovered it decades before I learned about Pierre Genet. Um, and I really credit my clients in the 70s for this, for the beginning of my discovery. But even earlier than that, you know, I started out teaching yoga and dance in a psychiatric hospital. And the, nobody was working with the body in the early 70s, but the patients who did both those classes seemed to get better. So that really piqued my interest in terms of how the body could help promote psychological health. And I think they got better. I just realized this recently, the last maybe three years ago, when I was writing a paper for one of Steve uh, Porges's books, and he wanted me to talk about my work and how the polyvagal theory interfaced with my work. 
And what I realized was that the, the, the yoga classes that were very slow and very um, relaxing stimulated that hypo-aroused state that traumatized clients go to so often is that instinctive defense, but it was without the fear. And then the dance classes, they're really high energy. We did these really fast line dances. You all are probably too young to remember the 70s, but it was really fun. And it was very much of a group activity and very lively. And that stimulated high arousal without fear. So I, I, I didn't really know anything about the polyvagal theory back then, but I could see a change in those patients. Um, at the hospital. And then in the 70s, I was an uh, adjunct therapist for Wardenburg Clinic here at the University of Colorado. And the clientele that they would send me were all young women who um, were, couldn't respond sexually. It was called mm -hmm. preorgasmic back in those days. I don't even think you hear that, that word anymore. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about trauma. This was maybe, I don't know, 77. So I was working with belief systems and relationally and with strong emotions and they didn't get better. Um, and I was really concerned. Some of them got worse, you know? Um, and I, I started realizing that it was, what the work I was doing was just too much for them. They'd go back into these memories and feel the terror and the fear um, so I thought, well, if I could just keep them in their bodies, uh, and that was the beginning. They started to at least not get worse, and some of them got better. And then we started noticing that movements would want to happen, like movements that were truncated. As Janae says, traumatized patients um, weren't able to complete the acts of triumph. The, they weren't able to push away the offender or run away or you know, scream and get help. So um, those acts of triumph, as, as discovered Janae in the late 90s, uh, um, are so important for traumatized people on, on, on two regards. One, for those who favor the, the uh, immobilized responses, because that's usually what works in childhood trauma. You can't get away, you can't fight back. And if your attachment figure's the perpetrator, you can't scream for help because they're already hurting you, you know? And so freezing and that collapse of feigned death are the best instinctive responses. Mm. But then, so working with action to restore the ability to push away, to run away, and to, you know, to reach out and get help, it's just can be so healing. But also I just want to say that, that many clients also have dysregulated uh, active defenses, like fight responses, like um, I'm thinking of a veteran I worked with, he would go into just rage and he would, he said he could break everything in the room. He would, and um, so he needed to regulate those actions. Hmm. So mm -hmm. on, on both ends to restore the ability to have, have more flexibility in those instinctive defenses, uh, uh, and also, but to regulate the ones that are overactive. So I'm aware of the kind of different audience that we've got on today's webcast. And what I thought I would do is just, again, just go back to a little bit of basics and then we'll build it up. So let's start off with, uh, firstly, orienting responses. Maybe talk a little bit about you know what that is because it, in most modes of psychotherapy nowadays and counseling, certainly in the UK and probably abroad, people just don't learn this, uh -huh. and it is so as you say absolutely imperative to working with trauma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's start off, Pat, with um, orienting responses. Talk a little bit about their, what they are. Um, you know how they show up. What clinicians might be looking out for in clinic. Okay. Well, I think of orienting in, in two, two different ways. One is the orienting reflex to novelty. Um, and I, I think the best way to understand this is, terms of, is in terms of the animal kingdom. 
I think we've probably all seen an animal that's startled and maybe they're like, I have deer in my yard, maybe they're eating my bushes or whatever. And if they hear a noise, everything stops. Yeah. And that's this arrest. Everything stops, but they're not frozen. And this is a reflex. When there's something new, especially something new that is sudden occurs, all activity stops and our senses become alert. You can see the deer's ears pick up and the the noses are wiggling and you can see them like sort of like what what is this? Where is it? And the orienting uh then they that sometimes they start looking around like towards the source of the noise. Yeah. Um, and if everything seems safe, then they go back to eating my bushes, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's the reflexive element of orienting to novelty. Uh, you, but I also think of it as, as a, um, a habit, especially for traumatized clients. Um, well, we all will develop habits of orienting to select elements of our environment. We all do that. We can't, there's no way we can orient to everything. There's too much yeah. stimulation, you know. So we all selectively orient depending on our history. Like if we did have a traumatic childhood, we will most likely develop habits of hyper orienting to any reminders of that trauma mm -hmm. to you know somebody a big man for example if you if you were abused by your father who is a big man you you might notice every big man that walks into the, the workshop for mm -hmm. example and, but we also have habits of orienting on other levels like if we were uh, uh, criticized a lot as children and we we might develop this habit of noticing every little bit of criticism and not being able to just uh, let it go. Um, and that can be really disruptive for all of us and especially for, for traumatized clients. So we see that orienting reflex in, in traumatized clients by uh, um, that kind of, I, I remember one, the same client I was talking about, actually the veteran, when we were reworking his memory, all of a sudden his, his neck extended, his eyes started scanning like this, and you could just see this orienting response uh, come into play. Um, yeah. So. So when uh, clinicians are in, in practice in clinic with, with someone, they might pick that up. I think yeah. what you're saying in terms of sort of neck straightening or a turning of the head or a pulling back with you know, maybe an, an, an eye or eyesight going either way. So how will it show up? What should clinicians be looking out for in, in, in clinic? Well, if we use Janae's language with all of this, um, and this is really the root of sensory motor psychotherapy, even before I, I, uh, I learned Janae's work, we, we look for um, the beginning of actions that will show up in the body that indicate in, incomplete actions. Um, so, uh, um, and then we want to help a client execute those actions we can see that this is this is the whole idea of trauma impacting first and foremost the body so if you see uh often you'll see it the fingers that are resting on the lap they might lift just a tiny bit or a person might have a little orienting movement but it's truncated uh, and the, the uh, but these are indicative of larger movements so when I see what's called preparatory movements, like a lift of a finger, you know, when we're tracking that, I might bring attention to it, like, oh, look, your, your finger is just lifted up. Do you notice that? And, and if a client says, uh, yeah, that's strange, you know, and I might say, well, let, let's stop for a moment. Let's just pause and find out about that lifting. Like, what might your body want to do? What, how do you sense it in your body? Is there an impulse, et cetera? And that often leads to uh, a movement, uh, like a pushing away in that case. 
with orienting, if you, uh, it often leads to a, a more fuller turn of the neck and sometimes even the body, a more full uh, orienting movement. But I, I mean, the wonder of it to me is how, how much we can trust the body to guide us. It's just amazing. Because all that healing is inside. All that impulse to grow and to heal, it's all in there. I, I think it was um, W.H. Auden, the poet, who said healing is coaxing nature. And there's nothing more natural than those impulses, those instincts that come up, and then we can just coax them into fruition. Mm, that sort of pure organicity that just happens. That's you know? right. That organicity, that, that, that intelligence is inside any living system. Yeah. Mm, so good to know. So Pat, let's talk about sort of, we've mentioned orienting, let's talk defense responses, um, say a little bit about what they are, and maybe like how when you finish that, what's happening in times of COVID with, um, and also we can talk about sort of the Black Lives Matter movement, like what's happening in terms of these really important movements, um, you know, fight flight responses, and yet we're in a time where people can't travel, um, uh, people are, are, um, are, are uh, need to uh, f fight and say what they want to say so we can end injustice and, and, and they're being stopped. Can you say a little bit more about that? This is complicated. So um, let's, let's start with COVID, okay? Because this COVID pandemic, it is a threat. Uh, it is a global threat to our safety, right? Um, a couple things I think that are important about it. It is an out, it's a, both an outside and an, an, an inside threat. So on the outside, you know, we take protective measures. We wear masks, we, you know, we don't go out, we do our best not to expose ourselves and others. And, and, and that's a way to deal with this outside threat. We can't push it away. Uh, we can't run from it. Although I suppose we could say if we're running to the safety of our isolation at home, maybe that's a version, but we can't get away from it in the same way that we could from a, a, a mugger, for example. Yeah. So it's an inside threat which requires, uh, uh, um, that aspect of it requires that we strengthen our immune systems and conserve our energies so that we can protect ourselves from the inside. Um, and there's a lot of note now that people respond very differently even if they do get this virus. Uh, and some of that is um, based on the, the strength of the system. You know? So uh, when I think of um, and work with um, first responders, like one person that I was uh, talking to, she's a PA working in the ER in New York. And um, she gets so hyper aroused with work mm -hmm. and so uh, frustrated, you know. And, and so one of the things so important to work with is to bring that arousal as quickly as possible within a window of tolerance for her well-being, but also for her immune system. Because if arousal stays outside of the window in a hyper or hypo aroused zone for long, that is going to impact your health and decrease your immunity, which leads right into uh, the BLM move, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, because marginalized people are already dealing with threat and injustice on a daily basis. So. Uh, um, and and now, think in in some ways, uh, it's become with the George with the George Floyd murder. It's become a a, a worldwide uh, movement. Um, there's so much to say about that. I don't know where to start. Do you have a specific question, or should I just talk? <laughs> I think uh, I'd love you just to talk, but we, we're, we're uh, only got, I mean, we could talk forever. I, I would like to, but we've only got 40 minutes. So yeah. I was going to think about maybe just um, looking at sort of, sort of 
how immobilized response, how defenses are immobilized and what people can do sort of to, to mobilize them in times of sort of fight, flight, etc. Um, well, in terms of, of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, we see dysregulated defenses all over the place. We see uh, police people in America who can't think clearly because they're triggered by a black man that they perceive as a threat. Uh, and, and the reason for that is much bigger than just these incidents because it really has to do with systemic oppression and white supremacy. And as white people, we are, I mean, everybody is steeped in it, but as white people, we are pretty much taught that uh, black people are threats. This is what we see on TV. This is what is portrayed in, in the media. So until we start to look at that systemically, uh, I think uh, anything that we do in terms of uh, defensive responses won't be capable of healing this this problem and it is worldwide i mean it's <clears throat> it's come front and center i think in america because of the tremendous legacy of slavery which wow. hasn't even been over for that that many years but in the uk too with all the colonization and everything else there's there's a lot of racism in, in the uk and all over the world um, but i think the important thing is to look at it from a systemic level to, to for our for us to look at not whether we have been affected by systemic racism, but how we've been affected by it and how that plays out in, in, in society and in our personal lives. Um, and we have to challenge those beliefs that we have learned uh, growing, up in a, uh, growing up with systemic oppression. Um, I think then what happens uh, from a marginalized person's perspective, they are living with threat ongoingly. I mean, Barack Obama, you know, talked about, or no, it was Michelle Obama that talked mm -hmm. about every time he would leave the house, she would worry long before he was president, is he going to come back? And this is a standard, this is consistent uh, across marginalized communities. Um, and now we see Asian people being threatened because certain leaders are calling it the China flu, which is a complete misnomer, but that's another form of racism. So uh, I think what we can, <clears throat> all of us can do, and which is critical for marginalized people to develop resilience is to be able to notice when arousal gets out of that window and then do something to bring it in, like right away in the moment. Put your hand on your heart, take a breath, get grounded, you know, feel your body, anything to bring your arousal back in the window. Um, because when trauma uh, um, hits, when we feel threatened, our cortex goes, our thinking brain goes offline in favor of our instincts. Um, so people act impulsively without thinking. And uh, so many black lives have been lost uh, because that, uh, that is an effect of systemic racism is affecting our, our, the people who are supposed to protect us. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, lots to sort of say on that. And as you said before, such a, you know, a complex situation um, and something that's just gonna take, you know, many years in time to work through and, and, and heal. Pat, let's talk about, um, we're, we were talking about sort of uh, truncated um, responses before. How does that sort of show up with regard to sort of boundaries? So um, how does, uh, how are boundaries affected through sort of truncated uh, uh, defense reactions, etc.? Well, boundaries uh, can be infected in, in many ways. Uh, I mean, everything's complex, right? There's no simple answer. Um, people often go into immobilizing responses 
of just not being able to take action, not being able to set a boundary mm. when they've had trauma, if that has been their, their pattern. Um, uh, so the, the ability to say no, I mean, this isn't, this just is action, this is saying no action. The ability to say no is truncated. Um, uh, the ability to um, uh, respond with an active um, action is often truncated. But I also want to say, in terms of um, uh, marginalization and oppression, um, there's also re research and theory that talks about reframing that in a different way when, when the oppressive forces are, are too large or too overwhelming to fight, then to choose not to respond is different. And I, I think that that's an important distinction because are you not responding because you've gone into an involuntary immobilization uh, where you can't take an action or are you on some level, even if it's not conscious, making the perhaps wise choice not to fight uh, or, or set a boundary against something that what's not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. I think with trauma, uh, we're, always, we're always looking at choice, whether it's individual trauma or systemic trauma. Mm -hmm. We're always looking at choice and opportunity. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more around that with regard to, you know, obviously for executive function where there's choice, um, there's more sort of consciousness with regard to choice. But yeah. sometimes the choice is unconscious. For example, you know, the reptilian brain will just choose to have a response. Right. So, you know, in uh, how we work nowadays is about sort of validating whatever the response. It doesn't matter if it's maladaptive or adaptive. It was once a choice. Can you just talk a little bit more about this and choice and prediction in the brain? Like, what, what happens? Well, I think of prediction in the body, if, uh, I can, if I can speak to that. Because look, if I, I'm gonna move back a little so people can see me. If my body is collapsed like this, you know, if I, if I don't have an aligned stance in my body, I'm already predisposed to have a passive response. Mm. Uh, my pot, that's just why it's so important to move with the bot, to, to uh, a work with the body with a client like this, who can't take an action, I want them to find a, a, a posture that is compatible with, with taking action. So, I mean, for, for the listeners, if you even collapse your body and try to make this pushing motion, it just, it just doesn't go anywhere, right? You can't get it. If you're aligned, it's much more, you're much more capable of it. But on the other hand, if you're mobilized, I mean, we all know people like this. We see people like this on the media often, especially in America, many of our leaders. And this, this predisposes you to aggression, which just does. This is like, I mean, I can feel it even in my voice. My voice is getting a little more assertive. I, feel, I don't feel as quite as heartfully connected with you. It changes everything if, yeah. if you're in this posture. So... This is why in sensory motor psychotherapy, we really work with uh, uh, helping people find the physical capacity to support adaptive action uh, not, and not dysregulated action. Hmm. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was I was really curious about what you said that you know there's always choice, and I I, I alluded to sort of whether that okay, yeah. is through sort of um, you know uh, executive function or or not, and how yeah yeah right yes well yeah to get back to that then like um, I I feel that people always make the the best choices for themselves. But the problem is, is that many of our choices are based on the past, right? So they're not updated to the present moment. Uh, and that's what we see in the people that their, their shoulders hunched or their bodies collapsed or whatever. I mean, all of us have these patterns that predispose us to respond from the choice we made consciously or unconsciously in the past that then is, is imposed on the present. And I think that's what's uh, uh, 
that's what we have to work with are those out, outdated really patterns so that we have more options. Mm. So someone, someone who had, say, had childhood trauma and responded by freezing and not pushing back, not fighting away, that was very adaptive in that situation, but that can bring a lot of pain and dissatisfaction if that's the only response you have after that content, that context has changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, with regard to trauma, how the part manifests in the present um, and how sensory motor really helps with that in terms of bringing people into the present or uh, working with things that are present moment experience? Right. <clears throat> well, we, we, we really do look at how whatever the issues or the resources are that the client is coming to therapy for, we, we look at how that's reflected and sustained in the body because the body will always participate. It, I mean, everything happens through our bodies, right? So no matter what the client is bringing to therapy, the body will participate in that, that difficulty. So if a, a client comes in with panic attacks, you'll see it. You might see the shoulders hunched, you might see the eyes wide, you might see a shallow breath, you know, and, and we track for that. Uh, if they come with um, uh, saying, you know, I never get any support, I'm all alone, I never get any support, we'll probably see that either in a little bit of collapse or, or, or something else. One of my clients, um, she talked about never getting, she talked about not being able to keep a boyfriend actually, and her, her chin was up like this. And she, she had no idea that this was her pattern. She had this kind of arrogant, you know, stance. I mean, just imagine going home to your, your husband or wife or partner with your chin up in the air. I mean, it, it, it's, it pushes people away, right? So we look at how the body participates in that, in that difficulty. And then from there, we, could, we have basically two directions. Um, um, you know, we could uh, work with resourcing, which would be her low, like extending her neck, lowering her chin with the panic person, learning to breathe deeply, learning to relax the shoulders, which somebody who can't, um, um, you know, who, who doesn't set boundaries to practice this, these motions. So those are all great resources. On the other side, if the client's window tolerance is wide enough, we can use the body to uh, uh, access um, history and formative beliefs. There's, there's quite a lot of research that, that points to if you take on a certain physical stance, like if, I mean, if, if we took on this panic stance and held it for a few minutes, we would start to be reminded of the times when this well, yeah, shake it off a little when this was operation, right? <laughs> yeah, you start feeling it. Yeah. And so the body can lead us also to early formative memories and relational interactions that then can be regulated and reworked in therapy uh, process. So we can go either into processing through the body or into resourcing. Yeah. And I imagine, you know, as we talk about the body, we can't but ignore emotions and feelings. Oh, no, because that's, it's all so connected. I mean, you know, I do little experiments with clients just about the connection, like, like let's, let's exaggerate that collapsed posture of yours, and, and we'll do it together, and let's see what kind of emotions and thoughts come up, and, or images because it, it will bring up, or we take on a different posture and then notice the difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. And you've got, I think, well, there's two amazing workshops coming up. You've got, we've got you coming up on the 16th and 17th of uh, July on Shame, and we've got Janina mm -hmm. Fisher at the end of July. Do you mm -hmm. want to say a little bit more about what you're doing and how people can access that? And Sure. Uh, well, I'm doing a, an online workshop on the relational nature of shame. Um, and I think it's, 
it's, I, I think we work with shame with everybody and it's often hidden. We don't recognize the signs. Clients rarely will come in and say, oh, I want to work with shame because shame, shame is, we hide it. We hide, shame has to do with us feeling bad, feeling like there's something wrong with us. And, and so we, we're shamed and we hide it and we don't bring it forward. So we'll talk, talk about that and how it lives in the body and, and then how we can work with the body not only to uh, resource shame, but also to really process it through. And, um, and, and I also want to talk about uh, privilege oppression dynamics, because I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the many reasons systemic oppression is continuing is because of, of white guilt and white shame and what some are calling uh, moral injury, um, where our ancestors have made horrific decisions in terms of their inhumanization of other people. Um, but just like trauma is transmitted transgenerationally, so that's so is perpetrator trauma, I would say. So I think that that's a hidden source of white uh, um, shame uh, mm. that I, I want to address a little bit in the workshop as well. Mm. That's really, really interesting. Um, yeah, so Kathy will be putting uh, th those details in the chat uh, box. Uh, hopefully people can sign up to that. And Pat, you've got a new book coming out as well, which is going to be Thank out you. shortly. Yeah, this book was, uh, it grew out of a conference, an interpersonal neurobiology conference that I did with all my friends that I work with, Dan Siegel, Alan Shore, you know, all these um, great people. Um, and it was in 2015, and I'm on the, I was on the board when we did that conference, and I suggested we do something on diversity. Ferguson had just happened, and I thought the time was right. And from that conference, I, I realized two things. It was very low enrolled, the lowest enrollment we'd ever had. And I realized how little I knew and we knew about systemic oppression and racism and diversity. So the new book grew out of that. At that time, I started a think tank at the Central Motor Psychotherapy Institute with BIPOC from the, I always, I use these acronyms now because they're so familiar to me, but I didn't know this even a year ago. Uh -huh. uh, Black Indigenous People of Color. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, and we started looking at the inherent racism in psychology and because uh, psychology was designed by and for white population. We started looking at implicit bias, uh, how it shows up in therapy, uh, and we started looking at how sensory motor psychotherapy can be applied to um, different populations. So the book is uh, about sensory motor psychotherapy in context. So we really look at bias and prejudice and, and, and therapy, microaggressions and, and yeah. It's, it, it's been a real learning experience. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Mm. So uh, I can't wait to get my hands on that book. And I, I imagine uh, people listening to this will all also really want to read it. So, and I can't say what a better time. I mean, it's just sort of necessary right now. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, I know, I, I think it, it's, it's really, Timely and in the field of psychology, well, and throughout the world, I think you know, there's a there's Audre Lord, a black uh, woman, she died, I can't remember, she lived in the last century. Um, she said, you, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, and I think that that's just a very important statement for all of us to look at how we have to change or orientation and, and find new tools in collaboration with our, our black and LGBTQ and POC colleagues. You know, and, yeah. So Pat, we've got about 20 minutes left and there's quite a lot of questions coming in. So um, okay. I could be super selfish and ask you some geek questions that I have in my mind, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go over to Q&A um, and okay. sort of see what's happening in here. 
so just bear with me. And again, if we don't get through all the questions, everyone, I apologize in advance, uh, but we'll get through as many as possible. Um, okay, let's have a look. So I think you've already answered this, but Francis Flint says, um, it feels like movement and body work has been removed from education. Do you think that early experiences of dance and movement would help adults manage trauma later in life? <laughs> I definitely think so. I think indigenous cultures have been using dance and movement for centuries to, to manage trauma. I, my mother put me in dance class when I was seven because she knew I was going to be super, super tall. And it's been a huge resource for me. I mean, I think that's a big part of why I got into using movement and dance and therapy. Charlotte Hillary says, uh, how would you work in a somatic way with a client who has uncontained anger when it comes up against what he perceives as injustice? Yeah. Well, you know, whenever, uh, whenever somebody asks me a clinical question, there's so many possibilities. Um, if we, and it depends on what lens we're looking through. If we look through the lens of defensive responses uh, uh, and the body, I would find out if we could use that anger to regulate uh, the defense, especially if he had impulses that could harm others or harm himself or th themselves. See, this, this, I caught myself because she did not say that the client was a, a man. And yeah. I'm, I'm just, so this is how bias shows up. I'm just using this as yeah. a teacher. Good oh, noticing like that. Him, <laughs> him instead of like them, right? Okay. So, because that, I mean, I'm in my 70s. It's, it's just, I'm just deep in this. So, um, I think we have to point it out when we see it or when we do it. Uh, but I would ask them to, if we could slowly explore that anger, and I would ask them to sense the anger, just the tip of it, the tip of the iceberg, the tip of it, and notice their body, and notice the impulses in their body. Uh, and, and often, you know, there's an, there's an impulse to strike out or to, you know, hit out or push out or something. And then I would want to have them execute that impulse in slow motion so that the cortex could stay online and the, and the subcortical brain didn't take over. Yeah. So that's one possibility. If we're looking at resources uh, to help regulate, we might look at grounding, like how can you ground? How can you stay centered with all this rage? If we're looking through uh, uh, racial injustice or systemic oppression lens, uh, I think there has to be a lot of validation, and especially if you're white, if you're a white therapist working with this with a person of color. If this client is a person of color, I don't think they said that either, did they? No. Yeah, but either way, I think a, a deep felt acknowledgement of of systemic oppression is definitely called for, especially in transcultural uh, or transracial therapeutic diets. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I mean, I think it just depends which lens you're working through. You know? yeah. if, if there's a memory there uh, that's triggering that rage, well, then you work with the memory. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, important. I think an important point you mentioned is it depends on the lens, you know, it depends yeah. on, is it trauma, is it developmental trauma, is it something, you know, there's, there's a number of lenses. Yeah, yeah, there's a number of lenses, and um, that's why therapy is so complex. There's no one size fits all. I, uh, yeah. And that, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, a couple more questions. Um, again, Michelle Brown, you know, it depends on the lens, and I know uh, Bonnie Goldstein and a number of the uh, SPI faculty work more with children and, and, and young people. But here's a question for you, Pat. Any thoughts on working with mother and baby dyads and trauma work, please, or maybe some oh. others? Yeah. Yes, of course. There's so many. I mean, I mean, it depends upon the trauma. You know, like if, if there's... Uh, 
I mean, we're talking about the mother's trauma, the baby's trauma, or if, for example, if, if the baby had a cesarean, if the mother had a cesarean, the baby then couldn't initiate the birth, which babies do by pushing with their heads and extending with their feet, just helping that action complete, like with the baby, like placing your hand on the head and the feet and letting them push and lengthen, because that action, you know, it does so much for them. It gives them that uh, um, um, efficacy. That they're, in, they're birthing, they're initiating the birth. Um, the, and then, you know, the vaginal canal massages the baby. And so if, so if, it's, if it's that kind of trauma, you know, you'd, do, you'd be doing a lot of skin to skin massage and um, completing those actions and so forth. Uh, if the mother had, I mean, it just, it's, it's so, it's so, I think the general principle is you look at the, the trauma and you look at what needs to be completed and what needs to be resourced, how arousal needs to be regulated, how uh, impulses need to be completed. And those impulses are so different depending on the individual and their trauma. So, um, I don't even know if that answers your question. But. Yeah, and I, and I think as well, you know, for those people who aren't sensory motor trained, um, uh, not that I'm biased or anything, but, you know, to do your level one training at least and possibly level two is just a great way to being, to noticing what lenses are available and how you can work with trauma, what type of trauma it is, because you go in yeah. different directions. So, you know, some of these questions going through, you know, coming through there's no quick fix it's it, it no. is training and it's proper training around trauma right that's right yeah yeah um somebody anonymous attendee says um what if the body says very little i have very suppressed i have a very suppressed depressed client i do not want them to be here they would say that they say for some time how do i work with this <laughs> Well, I find myself thinking, but the body never says very little. The body is always like speaking with a megaphone. <laughs> if it's speaking very, with stillness, that says worlds. It says action isn't safe. It says, might say my nervous system, I can't get my arousal up. But, you know, it, it, it says so much. Um, and again, there, there are so many options, you know. I mean, I always think about movement of any kind. Like I, I think of one client I had who, she just became incredibly still every time she came into my office. And so I remember, and she sometimes she couldn't even speak. And um, I met her at the door for one session, and uh, and I said, you know, why don't we why don't we start with just take let's just take a walk and talk a little bit. And because movement would got literally got things moving, um, so there's so many ways. Uh, if this client doesn't feel anything in the body, I might say, "Well, what does nothing feel like? Like, does it feel numb? Does it feel dead? Does it feel like no energy? Does it feel like?" And give a little menu to start a little sensitivity. Um, I've often done a little exercise, and for those of you watching, if you if you do it if you do it with me, like squeezing up one arm and down the other. I mean, I mean up and down one arm like this, like if you, not both arms, just one, just do one. I do this. I've done this often with clients who say I, I don't feel anything in my body. I don't even know what you're talking about feeling in my body. So we'll do this together and then pause. And, and I'll say, well, do, do you notice anything, difference between the two arms? And clients almost always do. So we find ways to kind of roll out the red carpet so it's not difficult to uh, connect with the body, you know? Yeah. And I, I think depression, I wrote a paper on this quite a while ago, can often, um, the source of it is, can be trauma related hypoarousal that's become habitual you know? um, so to work with it through action of any kind can can often be helpful 
Yeah, yeah, that's a really um, great example you gave. I think people will be happy, you know, with that because there's always a route into the body. Yeah. You just have to be creative around how you do that, really. Exactly. Yeah, and don't, I know, I mean, for me, I'm so steeped in the body. It's my go-to. Like, if, if I don't know what to do, I just go to the body. But people <laughs> with, with, with other oh, training, you know, they, can't, they, they kind of give up on the body. And I would say, don't give up on it. Just keep curious and mm -hmm. keep looking for little inroads. Mm -hmm. And I think the wonders of sensory motor psychotherapy, you know, that curiosity that comes from your training, you know, that just, yeah. that, just finding things interesting. Yes. And what is more miraculous than the, the body? Yeah. And we just, we don't even begin to understand how our bodies work, really. Absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing. Ingrid Collins says, um, you have been talking eloquently about the significant connection between the physical body and the intellect and emotions. And indeed, psychoimmunologists now talk about the body mind. As a psychologist and a registered spiritual healer, I agree this is so very useful in therapy. What do you see as the soul's energy connection to the system? <laughs> it can't be separated. I, you know, I did a workshop with, uh, uh, oh, his name just slipped my mind, Kalshed, Don Kalshed, a psychoanalyst in, in, in New York. And, um, and he was kind of mod moderating the, 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 the workshop and, uh, and, and at the final discussion, he said, well, what, what part of, how do you see the spirit? How do you see spirituality? What part of your work is spiritual? And, I, and, and my answer was, well, what part of it is not? And it's all spiritual. It's, to me, it's all spiritual work. Uh, and, and this sensory motor psychotherapy is very grounded in a, philosophical spiritual orientation that I wrote about in my in my new book you know when I met Bessel in 1993 or something and he said he said your work is so amazing he said it could really you know hit it could really translate into, into psychiatry and psychology he said but there's two things you can't do you can't talk about the spiritual stuff you talk about and you can't talk about touch and this uh -huh. is the 90s he said, because if you do, it won't be accepted. Yeah. So I did kind of put it on hold, both touch and the oh. spiritual aspect of this, of this work. But the new book um, um, has it in. I wrote a whole chapter on the spiritual philosophical foundations. Yeah. And yeah. So it's... And, and, and one of the concrete ways I see it in therapy, you know, that window of tolerance um, through therapy that... And through working with the body and arousal and all that window of tolerance starts to expand. So we can uh, hold more of what happens inside of us, but also more of what occurs on the outside and without getting, without losing our compassion or without getting dysregulated. And to me, what's more spiritual than that, than that window of tolerance is expanding, yeah. getting bigger and bigger and wider. Yeah, yeah what a... What, what a lovely answer and I uh, sort of quite interesting Bessel's response because I don't know if the APA would put CEs on spirituality like you know how do you, you no they <laughs> won't and they won't put it on touch right? so I know. Yeah. Mm. so but um yeah anyway that's yeah another n another hour talk on that one um yeah, right exactly <laughs> What's the difference, this comes from an anonymous attendee, what is the difference between individual and systemic trauma in your opinion, Pat? Well, individual trauma are the specific events that happen to us and affect us individually. Uh, often that trauma is from systemic oppression. Um, I mean, even sexual abuse, you know, I mean, I'm just realizing lately how, how steep we are in sexism and misogynism uh, and how Bessel, for example, he, he shared with me in, in his uh, psychiatry textbook in the 1970s at the University of Chicago, it said in black and white that incest between a father and daughter could be good for the daughter because it teaches her about sex in a safe way. I mean, I was 30 years old when he was going to 
medical school. So we are steeped in systemic oppression that very much affects the kinds and the form of the traumas that we experience individually. Um, um, and I think that's what's so difficult for, um, you know, healing trauma. Because if we think of all of our traumatized clients, I mean, I'm hard put to think of any client that wasn't affected in their trauma by systemic oppression. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And um, so this uh, question comes from a guy called Bill Merrington. Presumably it's a guy. Uh, but I, I want to sort of say as a, you know, as a woman, you know, he says, do you come across clients, men particularly, who might claim that they don't feel anything in the body? And I think there's something around here. We talk about marginalized groups, certainly in the UK, men not sort of showing emotions is getting a lot better. Uh, mm -hmm. But we do come from, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the complex problem I think we're in. Yeah, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, my first thought about that is, is, is how, uh, you know, we all shut off our emotions when, when we can't make sense of them or also when we are called upon to do things that aren't in alignment with our moral code. I mean, this, we, we see this with, with, uh, with veterans, you know, the, the whole idea of moral injury where they're just trying, doing the best to shut all that down, to not feel. Uh, what has happened, you know, and that there might be a relationship. I just thought maybe there's a relationship with the heteropatriarchy and shutting down emotions in, in white culture. I'd never really um, thought about thought of it in that way before, but I, I do think that we are uh, we're taught we're not taught as kids to value our emotions, and men are taught that less than women. And I, I don't know if this is a stereotypical, stereotypical comment, but um, I, I, I do, do see indigenous cultures and, and I'm thinking of my black, half my family's black and I'm thinking of that part of the family and boy, laughter and tears and emotion is very much freer in that part than my German English uh, history. Mm. It's interesting to think about. I'm, I'm just brainstorming here a little. I, yeah. Mm, pretty so exciting. Yeah. So we'll take a couple more questions because we're nearly on the hour. Um, let's just have a look. I think this is sort of really relevant to this time. Uh, it comes from Louise Platt. She says, in our age of social distancing and therapy by video calls, how do you think somatic therapy is affected by this? And what top tips would you offer us to keep somatic experiences integrated? Oh, well, I, I would, I, I, I want to tell you there's a free resource. Can I say this on sensory motor psychotherapy uh, website? I, Bonnie Goldstein and I did a, 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 a webinar on, translating sensory motor psychotherapy to online format. And then I did a subsequent webinar, and also free, to answer the hundreds of questions that came in and also talk about uh, work, working with privileged oppression and, yeah, through a, uh, in that format. Um, <clears throat> the tips, the first tip is to don't think it can't be done because it can. Uh, it might take a little more tracking and it might take collaborating with your client. Like, like okay, for example, with, with clients with the body, I very often start off a session about, in person, about should I, should I be closer to you or farther away from you? Like what's more comfortable in your body for that? And, and clients often say they don't know. And so I say, well, try it out. Let's, if I'm closer, you know, what do you notice? What, is, is there a shift in your body? If I'm further away, what do you notice? And I have a rolling chair, which is really nice, but you can also put a chair on a, on a, um, a carpet, you know, so on a rug sometimes. And, um, <clears throat> oh, you could just lean in and, and lean out um, because you can adapt 
all the stuff we learned in the training, you can adapt it online. You, know? you can do pushing motions. I have a big therapy ball here and in my in my little office and and you know i'll demonstrate pushing using the therapy ball sometimes my clients will have those balls as well and so we just find different ways we do have to be conscious of how our actions come across uh for example okay everybody i'm going to do this okay but be aware that this might not feel good if i'm saying okay let's do some pushing and i go like that it could really it comes across very distorted as if if I sit back and demonstrate even that looks a little bit distorted sometimes I'll do it a little more to the side so we just have to be aware um, of how our bodies uh, come across um, and some of our clients you know don't have even a private space and some of our therapists don't have private spaces so sometimes we're working with with uh, you know virtual backgrounds and all but but so you can still work with the body. You still can. I, I ask client, you can ask clients more questions to so say, you know, I'm going to ask you more questions, okay, about your body. And if you notice anything in your body, you tell me, because I can't see your whole body. And can we, is that okay with you? And so you just negotiate and collaborate and yeah. Thank you. So we're going to come to an end because it's just gone six o'clock. Um, Pat, I would just want to say a massive thank you to you for your time today. It was absolutely incredible to just spend some time with you and get to sort of hear that imparted wisdom that you have around the body and, and trauma. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome. Um, My pleasure. And to everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Just remember, we've got Pat Ogden's uh, Sensory Motor Psychotherapy uh, uh, webcast on shame, I think on the 16th and 17th of July. We've got Janina Fisher next week for a free hour. We've got her at the end of the month too. Um, there's Pat's book coming out. And if you're really interested in Sensory Motor Psychotherapy, there will probably be a level one training starting soon whether you're in Australia, America, England, somewhere in Europe, uh, it's all around the world. So thank you, everyone. And thank you so much, Pat, for your time. Bye okay. for now. Bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.